Hey, we have come to the book of Esther. I have to say it's probably one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament. It is one of the uh, sermons that I heard in college that I remember the most uh, uh, of uh, when it was preached, and I've preached in variations of that multiple times uh, over the years. It's just a great story. It's kind of like the first beauty pageant that we find in scripture. Some interesting things uh, about the book of Esther is that we don't know who wrote it. Uh, we know it's about a hundred years after uh, um, they've been taken away to Babylon, the Jews. Uh, so this is a little bit after Nehemiah, a hundred years, a couple of generations uh, have gone through. Uh, it takes place in the city of Susa, the Persian uh, capital. Uh, there's a large remnant of Jews that are living there. Remember, only a few percent went to back to Jerusalem uh, to rebuild and to live there. Uh, so there's a lot of Jewish people that are living uh, in the in the area of Susa, uh, where we get the story. Uh, one kind of quirk is in the in the book is that the net mention of God, the God is never mentioned. Uh, specifically in in this book um and and so but as you read through this you're going to find that while god may not be mentioned he is in behind the scenes interwoven through everything that's taken place it's awesome uh, it's it's obvious that things are not happening uh by chance uh there is a hand that is involved a divine hand so, without further ado, let's get into Esther chapters 1 and 2. King Xerxes of Persia lived in his capital city of Susa and ruled 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. During the third year of his rule, Xerxes gave a big dinner for all his officials and officers. The governors and leaders of the provinces were also invited, and even the commanders of the Persian and Median armies came. For 180 days, he showed off his wealth and spent a lot of money to impress his guests with the greatness of his kingdom. King Xerxes soon gave another dinner and invited everyone in the city of Susa, no matter who they were. The eating and drinking lasted seven days in the beautiful palace gardens. The area was decorated with blue and white cotton curtains tied back with purple linen cords that ran through silver rings fastened to marble columns. Couches of gold and silver rested on pavement that had all kinds of designs made from costly bright colored stones and marble and mother of pearl. The guests drank from gold cups and each cup had a different design. The king was generous and he said to them, drink all you want. And then he told his servants, keep their cups full. While the men were enjoying themselves, Queen Vashti gave the women a big dinner inside the royal palace. By the seventh day, King Xerxes was feeling happy because of so much wine. And he asked his seven personal servants, Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abaga Abagatha, Zethar, and Carcass to bring Queen Vashti to him. The king wanted her to wear her crown, and let his people and his officials see how beautiful she was. The king's servants told Queen Vashti what he said, and she re but she refused to go to him, and this made him terribly angry. The king called in the seven highest officials of Persia and Media. They were Karshina, Shether, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Memukin. These men were very wise and understood all the laws and customs of the country, and the king always asked them what they thought about such matters. He said to them, Queen Vashti refused to come to me when I sent my servants to her. What does the law say I should do about that? Then Memekin told the king and the officials, Your Majesty, Queen Vashti has not only embarrassed you, but she has insulted your officials and everyone else in all the provinces. The women in the kingdom will hear about this, and they will refuse to respect their husbands. They will say, if Queen Vashti doesn't obey her husband, why should we? Before this day is over, the wives of the officials of Persia and Media will find out that Queen Vashti has done, and they will refuse to obey their husbands. They won't respect their husbands, and their husbands will be angry with them. 
Your majesty, if you agree, you should write for the Medes and Persians a law that can never be changed. This law would keep Queen Vashti from ever seeing you again. Then you could let someone res who respects you to be queen in her place. When the women in your great kingdom hear about this new law, they will respect their husbands, no matter if they are rich or poor. King Xerxes and his officials liked what Mimikin had said, and he sent letters to all his provinces. Each letter was written in the language of the province to which it was sent, and it said that husbands should be complete, have complete control over their wives and children. After a while, though, King Xerxes got over being angry, but he kept thinking about what Vashti had done and the law that he had written because of her. Then the king's personal servant said, Your Majesty, a search should be made to find you some beautiful young women. You can select officers in every province to bring them to the palace, to the place where you keep your wives in the capital city of Susa. Put your servant, Haggai, in charge of them since that is his job. He can see to it that they are given the proper beauty treatments. Then let the young women who pleases you, then let the young woman who pleases you most take Vashti's place as queen. King Xerxes liked these suggestions and he followed them. At this time, a Jew named Mordecai was living in Susa. His father was Jer, and his grandfather, Shimei, was the son of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. Kish was one of the people that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem when he took King Jeconiah of Judah to Babylonia. Mordecai had a very beautiful cousin named Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadessa. He had raised her as his own daughter after her father and mother died. When the king ordered the search for beautiful women, Many were taken to the king's palace in Susa, and Esther was one of them. Haggai was put in charge of all the women, and from the first day, Esther was his favorite. He began her beauty treatments at once. He also gave her plenty of food and seven special maids from the king's palace, and they had the best rooms. Mordecai warned Esther not to tell anyone that she was a Jew, and she obeyed him. He was anxious to see how Esther was getting along and to learn what had happened to her, so each day he would walk back and forth in front of the court where the women lived. The young women were given beauty treatments for one whole year. The first six months, their skin was rubbed with olive oil and myrrh. The last six months, it was treated with perfumes and cosmetics. Then each of them spent the night alone with King Xerxes. When a young woman went to the king, she would wear whatever clothes or jewelry she chose from the woman's living quarters. In the evening, she would go to the king, and the following morning, she would go to the place where his wives stayed after being with him. There was a man named Shazgaz who was in charge of the king's wives. Only the ones the king wanted and asked for by name could, be, could go back to the king. Xerxes had been king for seven years when Esther's turn came to go to him during Tebeth, the tenth month of the year. Everyone liked Esther. The king's personal servant, Haggai, was in charge of the women, and Esther trusted Haggai and asked him what she ought to take with her. Xerxes liked ex Esther more than he did any of the other young women. None of them pleased him as much as she did, and right away he fell in love with her and crowned her queen in place of Vashti. In honor of Esther, he gave a big dinner for his leaders and officials. Then he declared a holiday everywhere in his kingdom, and gave it expensive gifts. When the young women were brought together again, Esther's cousin Mordecai had become a palace official. He had told Esther never to tell anyone that she was a Jew, and she obeyed him, just as she had always done. Bigthana and Teresh were the two men who guarded King Xerxes' rooms, but they got angry with the king and decided to kill him. Mordecai found out about their plans and asked Queen Esther to tell the king what he had found out. King Xerxes learned that Mordecai's report was true, and he had the two men hanged. Then the king had all of his written, all of this written down in his record book as he watched. So here's what we see that is taking place. I want to show you Xerxes 
was not a good king. We see him uh, winning people over, but he was just not uh, uh, nice. He was mean. He did a lot of things that was very, um, very hateful. So uh, here we have Jerusalem. And he, right around in here is Susa, uh, where everything has taken place. Now, just so you can see the Persian Empire, King Xerxes uh, dominance is all this pink area. It is humongous. He is in charge. So this party that he throws uh, is really a it's 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 a it's a big party, and he invites people from all areas, all languages. He's trying to get everybody together because what this really is is a six month military planning session. His goal is to defeat the Greeks. And just so you can see how evil uh, Xerxes is, uh, we got Greece over in, in this area. His desire, he wants to build a bridge right here so that he can cross over and, and attack. Uh, and his uncle and all of his military advisors saying, you know, that's a bad idea. We start working on this and the Greeks are just going to destroy it. It's not going to go well. King Xerxes was adamant about it. And he says, build it. Well, they build it, and then a storm comes, and it wipes out the bridge. It is completely destroyed. Because, and he is so furious that this takes place, he orders the ocean to be whipped first. Um, so they whip the, or the ocean, you know, like bad, o bad ocean. And, and then he takes all the supervisors of the bridge project, and he decapitates them. He just kills him because they screwed up and did not build the bridge uh, the way that, that he wanted to. Between chapters one and two uh, is a long period of time. Several years uh, are taking place as he continues to dominate uh, with, his, with his army. Um, and so uh, we're going to see some, some cool things. You got to keep in mind uh, um, what... Mordecai did, and that it was written down um, in the annals, because uh, we're going to come back to that uh, later on. It is going to be an important deal. So the goal is to be faithful, uh, to be faithful to God, and that is how God is going to use Queen Esther, and we're going to find out in our next time together. Have a great week.